agency, who is going to carry out the transformations that would make permanent revolution a reality in countries like Egypt and Tunisia. Social media and social movements, really what we've seen in the past few months has been an incredible um, explosion uh, of debate and blogging, theorizing, hype, all kinds of different uh, analyses and takes on the role of the, uh, of the internet and specifically about the role of social media in shaping the kinds of protest movements that we've seen um, uh, happen in the past year. And now social media is, uh, according to uh, Wikipedia, although of course this changes from day to day, but uh, internet applications such as Facebook, Twitter and YouTube, which facilitate the creation and exchange of user-created content. They've been identified as key to all kinds of political events, from the rise of the student protests in Britain at the end of last year, uh, through to the Arab revolutions that are continuing to this day. Uh, of course, we've got to locate this in a long-term trend in which various theorists, uh, academics, commentators, pundits have tried to claim the internet as being the next big thing, the new game changer in terms of how uh, social change comes about. Um, this is uh, true of the boosters of... Uh, globalization on the right if you think about people like Thomas Friedman for example um, in a review of his book the Lexus and the olive tree uh, the uh, economist Paul Krugman summarized Friedman's attitude as we are heading for a world that is basically democratic because you can't keep them down on the farm once they have internet access and you know it's, it's it, it might sound quite true but that is uh, for a lot of the uh, for a lot of the arguments pretty much as far as it goes and then on the left of, uh, of the movement, you have a very different um, kind of, uh, kind of uh, idea. This is summed up quite well by Laurie Penny. Uh, Laurie Penny, who is a radical journalist and activist, who said um, uh, just before Christmas, the young people of Britain do not need leaders and the new wave of activists has no interest in the ideological bureaucracy of the old left. Their energy and creativity is disseminated via networks and many young people have neither the time nor the inclination to wait for any political party. And she was incredulous that newspapers like Socialist Worker were still being peddled at every demonstration to young cyber activists for whom the very concept of a newspaper is almost as outdated as the notion of ideological unity as a basis for action. Um, you know, so, so there's quite an extreme range of, I, of ideas um, on this. And you can see how this kind of thinking was very much reinforced with the explosion of the Arab revolutions just months later. If you looked, uh, for example, at Google, um, when I was writing the article that this talk is based on um, in early March, uh, a search on Google for Twitter revolution brought up 203,000 hits. And so it's being talked about a lot. And what we've also seen, of course, since then is the way in which a lot of this uh, uh, talk about the internet uh, has been reinforced by the rise of Los Indignados, the movement that has, has gripped Spain and then the occupation, um, the occupations in the squares in Greece as well. Um, and, and so you're starting to see manifestations of new types of online uh, organization. Uh, a lot of the people who are proponents of this uh, also tie it into other things such as consensus decision making, uh, arguments around organisation. There's a lot of overlap uh, in this with a, with a meeting that happened yesterday uh, that Robin Barrett gave on, uh, on, social, uh, on, um, on consensus and, and, and democracy. I don't want to go too much into that, but there will be elements of this which, which come out in my talk. And I certainly want to say from the start that I'm not going to uh, stand here now and say that the internet isn't important and didn't play a role in these kinds of movements. It absolutely is important and it did play a role. What I really want to get to uh, the heart of, though, is that uh, amongst the people who are pushing the internet as a new organisational model, 
Um, they're saying that it, it means that it's, it's, there's a kind of technological determinism which says that it smooths out over the need to build political organisations. If you read some people such as uh, like Guy Aitchison and Aaron Peters who were very heavily involved in the occupation that happened here at UCL and within the student movement, you know, they, they celebrate this as being a great thing. Now we don't need organisations because things get sorted out through uh, the networks uh, on the internet. I think that there is a profound mistake being made if you think that we can get around the necessity of organisation. And, and moreover, if we do have that as our starting point, then we miss out on how actually using the internet, using social media, things like that, can be of use to the left and all of those who are seeking radical change. And in a way, it's not surprising that there has been so much debate because social media themselves lend themselves to this. You have oodles and oodles of bloggers and citizen journalists and people chatting away on your Facebook wall and all kinds of different things. And so it perpetuates itself. And so in order to try and penetrate through the data smog to really get down to brass tacks, you, try, you have to try and understand how the internet has changed in recent years and how this can actually be applied to various social movements. So if you think about the, the growth of internet access in recent years, um, the, the website Internet World Stats, which brings together information from a, a variety of regional uh, providers, estimates that in the 10 years between 2000 and 2010, the number of people with access to the internet grew by almost 450% from around 360 million to just under 2 billion. This represents th just over 30% of the world's population. This is quite an enormous growth uh, in 10 years. And the most rapid areas of growth, although from very low starting points, have been in Africa, where 10.9% uh, of people now have internet access, uh, from 4.5 million to 111 million, an increase of almost 2.5 thousand percent. And in the Middle East, where the internet access now stands at just under 30% of the population, up from 3.3 million to 63 million. And at around 420 million internet users, there are more internet users in China than there are people living in the entire United States. So we're talking about quite an, an enormous explosion in access to the internet itself. But also in terms of social media, if you think about Facebook, it grew between 2009 uh, to today from about 150 million users to 500 million users, half a billion people with a Facebook um, account. And in March, Facebook announced that in Britain alone, it had reached 30 million uh, registered users. So almost half of the British population uh, have a, a, a Facebook account. This is quite you know, a, a large number of people, I think everyone would agree. But the question is, does this really qualitatively alter the scope of the internet in terms of bringing about or being uh, a, a tool for social change. If you think back to 1996, there was a campaign that was run against uh, government censorship on the internet. And at that time, Wired magazine, one of the first uh, on, uh, magazines about the online world, said that the public square of the past, with pamphleteering, soapboxes, and vigorous debate, is being replaced by the internet, which enables average citizens to participate in national discourse, publish a newspaper, etc., etc. It also enables average citizens to gain access to a vast and literally worldwide range of information. Well, this was in 1996, and for the next 10 years, I think it's fair to say that no one really saw the internet as fulfilling that kind of potential. Things changed then in 2006. In 2006, Time magazine uh, publishes its person of the year, and it's, a it's got a mirror on the front cover, and it reflects your face, and it says the person of the year is you, because now we have the interactive internet web 2.0 uh, and in web 2.0 unlike the overhyped dot-com web of the late 90s they said it's really a revolution an opportunity to build a new kind of international understanding not politician to politician but citizen to citizen and so this has been articulated in, in, in a variety of different ways, notably, for example, Joss Hans, the communication theorist, who said that the digital networked age is one that can be and is amenable to horizontal communicative action and lends itself to a horizon of dissent, resistance, and rebellion. So essentially arguing that the internet gives rise 
to uh, the possibility of overcoming the need for organization and overcoming even the old bureaucratic forms of trade unions, of social democratic parties, and the state itself, in a lot of ways borrowing from the network theorist Castells and, uh, and trying to bring this into the, into the realm of arguments uh, around political organization. Now, on the other hand, you've got another group of people who have a very different take on the possibilities of social media. So, for example, you have people like Evgeny Morozov, who wrote uh, a very interesting book called The Net Delusion, where he, where he talks about this idea of slacktivism rather than activism, slacktivism, which he describes as a feel-good online activism that has zero political or social impact. It gives those who participate in slacktivist campaigns an illusion of having a meaningful impact on the world without demanding anything more than joining a Facebook group. And he says that the ideal type of activism for a lazy generation, why bother with sit-ins and the risk of arrest, police brutality or torture, if one can be as loud campaigning in the virtual space? Now, I think we can already say that there's a problem with that, kind of, with that kind of analysis. Because it's not true that a lot of the people who've become involved in political activism through the internet are staying at home. They are occupying, they are involved in sit-ins. So this kind of perspective, I think, is, is, is a problem. If we look at a, a, a little bit more interesting um, uh, writer on the subject is, is a guy called Malcolm Gladwell, who I'm sure a lot of you will have, will have heard of and read about. And in his, heart, his article, Small Change, Why the Revolution Won't Be Tweeted, um, he says that social media generates networks based around weak ties. And so it's about organizing your acquaintances, people that you don't really catch up with, rather than strong ties. Uh, and for, for him, it means that social media allows large numbers of people to sign up to a campaign by not asking too much of them. And he argues against the boosters of social media by saying that it doesn't increase motivation, they increase participation by lessening the level of motivation that participation requires. It, but it's a very similar kind of track to what Morozov is talking about. And then you've got Micah White, who is very much a left-wing activist. He's a contributing editor to Adbusters, the culture-jamming um, uh, radical magazine. And he sees there being a battle raging for the soul of activism between digital activists who have adopted the logic of the marketplace and organizers who vehemently oppose the marketization of, of social change. And he says that the trouble with these online campaigning groups is that it uncritically embraces the ideology of marketing and accepts the tactics of advertising. The obsession with tracking clicks turns digital activism into clicktivism. And he says that ineffectual marketing campaigns spread cynicism and draw attention away from genuinely radical movements. Political passivity, in the end, is a result of replacing salient political critique with the logic of advertising. So if Michael White is right, then there's, there's a real problem with the growth of the internet. But I think here we have to draw a bit of a distinction between different forms of online uh, activism and online campaigning. There's the model of um, things like Move On in the United States, another kind, uh, Tick, 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 the, uh, the online um, climate change campaign that are very much uh, based within a kind of NGO framework or, uh, or that are very much tied to a political party, for example, the Democrats in the United States. But I think it's fair to say that for most of us who've been involved in campaigns uh, in the last few years, the people who we've met who are interested in digital and online activism are somewhere in between these two polls. Um, and I think that we have to also say that, for example, you, know, it didn't, you didn't need the internet to create a scenario where people who are involved in ineffective forms of political campaigning that they think are, um, that they think are doing good. So people who think it's you know, enough to just vote for a particular party every few months or give money to the, every few years, sorry, uh, give money to the nicest charity or, or boycott the biggest supermarket. These aren't ideas that have grown out of the internet or hegemonize the ideas of people who are using the internet. But just like uh, these kinds of uh, political identifications, uh, use, people who use the internet with, uh, to sign a petition or whatever, you know, at the centre of that is a germ of serious political engagement. Increasingly, I think, we meet at our public meetings uh, or on de demonstrations, people who found out about them on the internet, people whose first political act was signing an online petition or were politicised after reading a, p a particular blog. So one of the real challenges that we face on the left is to think creatively about how we engage with these kinds of people and draw them in to the kind of political activity that we see as being necessary to change the world. 
world. And so this has been happening in a number of ways, and I want to go through a couple of different campaigns. Um, the first one is perhaps the most politically removed from, from what we're trying to do, but in many ways is one, has been one of the most significant, which has been the, ca the campaign that was used online uh, around Barack Obama's election campaign in 2008. Um, David Plouffe, who was uh, Obama's campaign manager, said that the campaign created a domino effect, which used the internet, text messaging, and other forms of communication to build a now legendary grassroots network of organizers and volunteers. And the, the level of engagement online was quite surprising. Um, on the uh, mybarackobama.com, the social media hub of the campaign, volunteers created uh, more than 2 million profiles, planned 200,000 offline events, formed 35,000 groups, and raised $30 million on personal fundraising pages. But this campaign was much more than just an online success. You know, if they were able to uh, organize street campaigns because people would input their postal codes or their zip codes in America uh, and be able to contact those people and get them out onto the streets. And Thomas Gensimer, one of the key players behind this internet strategy, said that the key to the internet campaign was giving people real things to do in their neighborhoods. And of course, as I've already said, this is quite uh, distant from our politics. What they were talking about here was not creating some sort of grassroots campaign. Who said after the election, we wanted to control all aspects of our campaign. We wanted control of our advertising, and most important, we wanted control of our field operation. We did not want to outsource these millions of people. Uh, and so this success shows that social media can play a role um, as an organizer, but there are limits to what we can take away from this, of course. It can't tell us a lot about how useful it is to socialists and working class activists, because we don't have millions upon millions of dollars to invest in that kind of campaign. We don't have full-time staff with corporate sponsorship and corporate backing who can push this through. So if we look closer to home geographically and politically, we can look, for example, at the perhaps the two most interesting examples of where online activism has, has, has fed into uh, street activism, which has been around the G20 meltdown protests uh, in 2009 and the student uh, protests. So if you think about the G20 meltdown, now famous for where huge numbers of people were kettled on the streets where Ian Tomlinson was uh, uh, attacked and killed by the cops. But if we look to how it was built, where it came from, um, you know, it started off set up by a relatively small group of people. They started um, an, an, an internet campaign uh, and at first, that's how it started. But it wasn't left simply at that. The narrative of this huge protest that was built up not just through the, um, through the internet, but crucially through the bourgeois media. You could not move from reading newspapers and watching uh, the TV about how this was going to be an enormous demonstration. Anarchists were going to be out in the streets. And this media saturation made the event unavoidable. And it was this interplay between the internet, the kind of figureheads that were being put up on the, on the TV, people like Chris Knight, uh, and then the, the, the articles that you couldn't avoid in the newspapers created this kind of picture of that demonstration as being one that uh, if you were young and angry and wanted to do something about the bailouts, that was the place to be. Uh, this was equally clear, uh, but on a much, much bigger scale um, uh, in the student protests. So if you think about the occupation of Millbank Tower, uh, the way in which the, you know, the very next day the Independent said that this had broken the cuts consensus in Britain. But what's really interesting about this is the way in which it was the failure of the NUS, the National Union of Students, that created an atmosphere and created the context in which uh, uh, outside structures could start to push for more radical action. Because there was organization, it's crucial to understand. Day X was the day when 130,000 students walked out of their schools. Uh, it was publicized on the internet, it, it, it fed through Twitter and Facebook, all the rest of it. It was actually called by a very small meeting of campaign, uh, campaigners in the national campaign against fees and cuts. It was then backed at a unanimous vote at the Education Activist Network when hundreds of people attended to discuss the, uh, the student movement on the 31st of October. And it really started to pick up momentum after the NUS abdicated the field um, of struggle. And so even if you think about the 10th of November protest itself, 
you know, the, 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 the seeds of the ability for these campaigns to call for people to come out, it came from the fact that the NUS mobilized 50,000 students on the street. They threw their entire resources into building it. Uh, they put on buses, they laid on coaches, all kinds of things. And so we have to be aware of the way in which there is an interplay between those old structures uh, of, of, of organization and some of the newer ways of organizing. And crucially, again, after the, uh, the occupation of Millbank, it's not true that it was just the internet that spread the information. The internet was very important, but again, you couldn't move for see, you know, seeing Mark Bergfeld's face in the paper saying we had to bring down the government and by all means necessary, these kinds of things. It was very much, again, a reciprocal relationship between different forms of media and different forms of organization. Um, and it really, what the, the other thing that you saw is that in the absence in certain parts of the country of left-wing organization on the ground, you know, people could see on Facebook that, that people, uh, their friends were organizing walkouts. They could see that things were going on in different parts of the country. But it would be a mistake to think that the walkouts were, emerged simply from this. The first wave of universities that went into occupation, for example, were where socialist and radical students had a base, put an argument for that kind of activism. The schools with the biggest walkouts tended to be those with left-wing agitators working within them. And so for us, really, what we have to think about is, is not how we sort of look at these uh, internet technologies as being a replacement for old forms of organization, but rather, how can we rebuild the kinds of networks of activism and solidarity, the kind of political organization we need, and can these kind of online networks play a role in doing that? And the final thing I want to talk about in this section um, is obviously about the Arab revolutions. You know, uh, it's, it's worth going back to the Iranian protest, the Green Movement of 2009, where people were saying, you know, Alec Ross, the uh, Hillary Clinton's senior advisor for innovation, said that social media had played a key role in organizing the protests. But actually, if you look at what went on in Iran, it was quite different. So analysis by Sysimos, a, a social media analysis company, found that there were less than 20,000 Twitter accounts registered in Iran, which is 0.027% of the population on the eve of the elections in 2009. Um, if you, you look at a lot of the analyses that come out of the region, and what they argue is that the strength of social media was getting the information out of Iran so people around the world could see what was going on in the streets. But this didn't stop, of course, the media from picking up and talking about Facebook revolutions. It was the same thing again this year. And it's not a surprise that the bourgeois media will pick up on these things and say, yeah, that this is the new reason why revolutions are breaking out. You know, at the end of the day, revolutions were supposed to be something that belonged to history. You know, we, we don't have revolutions anymore. After 1989, uh, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, this was uh, something that was part of the past, the working class as an agent of social change was certainly something that was, uh, was part of the past. And when the Egyptian working class became a decisive factor in bringing down Mubarak, the limits of this kind of narrative were exposed. But even within Egypt, it's clear that uh, a lot of people look to social media, use social media uh, to, be, you know, to talk to other people about their opposition to the regime, uh, to build up their confidence uh, to go out onto the streets. But this is a very, very narrow layer of activists that were involved in this. Uh, when I was writing the article, I spoke to the Egyptian blogger Gigi Ibrahim. And she, I talked to her about what was the real role of social media in the protest movement. And she said that the coordinations for the demonstrations didn't tend to happen um, on the internet. They were in face-to-face -face meetings. Um, and, and crucially, she said that Facebook and emails had been used to call demonstrations in Egypt for years. And yet every time they called one of these demonstrations, there would be the same 50 or so people that would then have to run away from the security services. Something changed between that, and it wasn't just that all of a sudden, between one demonstration and another, a huge number of people started to take Facebook much more uh, seriously. Um, and in fact, what you have to look at is the way in which this played a role in an international uh, uh, sphere. You know, the, the confidence that people gained from the events in Tunisia, the systematic work that then people went to do, putting in leaflets, raising slogans in the poorest 
areas of Egypt, often getting beaten by the security services at the same time. But it was this that actually brought masses of people out onto the streets and again connected with the general uh, uh, feeling of, of um, injustice that they were feeling, not just in terms of the democratic deficit of living under, di under dictatorship, but also the impact of uh, austerity, uh, of neoliberalism, and the way that these all fed in to, uh, to, this, um, to this process. And uh, a guy called Sultan al qasemi a journalist based in the United Arab Emirates, who um, uh, it writes extensively about online um, activism and covered the uprisings in the region, he said that social media has certainly played a part in the Arab Spring revolutions, but its impact is often exaggerated. Egypt was disconnected from the outside world for days, and yet the movement never stopped. Where social media had a major impact was conveying the news to the outside world, bloggers and Twitter users who were able to transmit news bites that would otherwise never make it to mainstream news media. And the speed at which this kind of information travelled around, I think, was very inspiring to all of us who, you know, who were watching these kinds of things on Al Jazeera, who were following it on Facebook and Twitter and, and all of these other things. And also, you know, you could draw real inspiration, for example, where you saw that fantastic photograph of an Egyptian protester in Tahrir Square holding up the, 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 the sign saying Egypt supports Wisconsin workers and that sense of real genuine um, internationalism. If you, you think about Wisconsin actually, John Stavrelis who was one of the 50 people uh, who was involved in the first uh, attempt to occupy the Capitol building. He said that the inspiration came from the student demonstrations in Britain and the protests in Tunisia and Egypt. So you can see that there is this interplay that's going on. And so the internet and social media can often be a very useful complement to these kinds of activism. But where it's seen as a replacement, then it can be incredibly unsuccessful. Um, I was involved in a campaign to try and stop the closure of Hoover's factory a number of years ago. Um, and we set up a, a Facebook group that within days had thousands of members. We uh, called a, a, a protest meeting which had thousands of people attending it. Um, this got me uh, and the campaign into newspapers. Uh, it got us on the radio doing interviews, etc. Uh, we came to the meeting. The only uh, Hoover's worker who was there was my dad. <laughs> and so you can see that there are, there, there, are, there are real limits when you try to limit the way in which you campaign to online um, activity. And also, of course, and this is the, where I want to, want to end, really, um, the, the, the way in which the explosive nature of these protests uh, has led to the arguments about how organization is unnecessary really elides a crucial aspect for anyone who's trying to come to grips with the way we change the world, and that is the question of class. So on the 25th of January, when the Egyptian regime closed down the internet, what did this display? It, I mean, it showed that the, pro, that the revolution went on without the internet, absolutely. But it also flagged up that crucial class element um, of society. They could turn off the internet. They could shut it down. Um, the, uh, the internet service providers that you rely on to access the internet are big corporations, BT, AOL, Sky, all of these. You think about Vodafone in Egypt. They were told to shut down their network. They were then told to send out pro-Mubarak text messages. They did all this. And then after the revolution, they had the cheek to run an advertising campaign suggesting that they were the bloody inspiration for it. I mean, this is the kind of, of crass attitude that they have. And then if you think about social media, you know, Facebook, they have the ability to eject users at will. They can restrict the kinds of groups, you know, they click... Famously, on the day of the royal wedding, they shut down a huge number of groups because they weren't technically constituted um, correctly. And, of course, these, again, are massive corporations. Um, Goldman Sachs um, partially owns Facebook. Uh, JP Morgan have been trying to buy a stake in Twitter. I was reading uh, an article from the Wall Street Journal this week uh, where it said that uh, just on Monday, a small uh, investment firm called GSV Capital Corp made what seemed like a modest investment. They put down $6.6 .6 million to purchase private shares in Facebook. Uh, and this pushed up shares of that corporation by 42% adding $14 million in new market value in six and a half hours. And so this is the kind of enormous um, money that is f flowing around. That values Facebook at around 80 billion uh, US dollars. But away from this kind of, uh, this kind of area, I mean, it's, it's, it should be obvious that capitalism can exploit new 
uh, areas of accumulation and the internet isn't, a, isn't an exception. But class is also a crucial consideration when it comes to considering the organisational consequences of some of the arguments that are put forward by uh, the proponents of this absolute novelty of the internet. So if you think about when Laurie Penny says that in order to be properly effective, rebels have to deregulate the resistance, actually she's accepting a very specific neoliberal stereotype of the structure of the working class where she goes on to say the power of organised labour has been undercut across the world by building in higher structural unemployment and holding down wages, atomising workers, outsourcing globalisation and keeping working people tied to divided and suspicious communities. Uh, a writer called Kevin Dugan wrote an interesting analysis of this kind of idea and he warns in that book about people, uh, about socialists and radical activists, uh, the problem of becoming left-wing harmonies in the neoliberal chorus. We have to be very careful when we, try, when we say these kinds of things because what we do need to do is to try and understand how patterns of employment have changed. And I, I think that it's fair to say that the wave of strikes that we're seeing in Greece, the kinds of activism we've seen uh, in, uh, in Egypt, in Wisconsin, and of course here this week the enormous uh, uh, strike and the protest that happened show that we should not go along with these, uh, uncritically, with these kinds of ideas that the, the working class is finished. It's, 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 it's not the kind of idea that is going to help us out when we try to think about how social media can be useful. And she, you know, Laurie also goes on to say, for example, that uh, exchange of information and changes of plan via Twitter and text messages can happen in the middle of demonstrations. Well, this is all very well if you're talking about a very small demonstration. It's not very useful if you're talking about the 30,000 who marched the other day, the half a million or more who marched on March 26. So there's a question of um, there's a question of scale. And the final thing I want to come to, um, and this is where I'll wrap up, um, is the question of strategic thinking and the efficacy of different forms of political activism. You know, Paul Mason, the Newsnight economic editor, said that with Facebook, Twitter, and Yfrog, well, Yfrog is, a, is, a, is another one that we haven't even come across yet, uh, <laughs> truth travels faster than lies and propaganda is inflammable. Well, the obvious question to this is why? Why is it that, uh, that, that, that things travel so fast that the truth is also uh, travels faster than lies. It reminds me of, a, of, of an old student po uh, poster which, which says, coffee, do stupid things quicker. And you know, it, it, it doesn't follow that because things happen very quickly, that it overcomes the problems of uneven consciousness, of, of contradictory ideas within society. Now, Mason says that strategic questions are solved through memes, which is Richard Dawkins' concept of these cultural ideas that replicate and mutate like genes do in organisms. A terrible reductionist um, idea, incredibly vague, and has, it can't really uh, help us at all in trying to understand how this works. So Mason says that ideas arise and are quickly market tested and either take off, bubble under, insinuate themselves in the mainstream, or if they are no good, disappear. But what do we mean by good or bad? Well, you know, what, what will happen is that people who like doing a certain thing will say, oh, we're going to do this, and then a certain thing will happen. But what does that say about its consequences for actually transforming society? For that kind of thing, you need a much clearer strategic way of working out whether or not the things we're doing are working or not. Uh, because otherwise you can find yourself in the kinds of problems where you're not really sure where to go next. You know, some of these organisations that have emerged that we've worked very closely with recently are having that kind of strategic sort of, um, uh, disorientation right now. Where do we go now after what we've done? And this is really where it, you can see the striking similarities with what has gone before rather than the absolute novelty. So Chris Harmon wrote about the student movement that erupted in America in the 1960s, that spontaneity and lack of structure could fit situations of sudden explosive involvement of large numbers of students as they took to the streets and occupied buildings. They unbalanced the authorities and did not worry unduly about strategy, tactics and organisations. But when movements were forced to retreat, people began to feel the need for structures and for some understanding of the forces at work in society and ideology. And then as now we live under a capitalist system in which workers are the source of profits. Workers have the collective power to stop exploitation and change the world. We've seen this in Egypt, we've seen glimpses of it in Greece, on the streets of Britain this week. 
And consciousness among these workers is uneven. Political organisation is a recognition of the fact that some people break more quickly with the established ideas and that we want to group together those people in order to spread their ideas, to win others to their ideas and to counter the manoeuvres of the ruling class and the state. Final paragraph, I swear. <laughs> the, late, um, the late architect, Cedric Price, once commented that technology is the answer, but what was the question? And I think that that is something that you can, <laughs> that you can relate to the, the question of social media. Social media is the answer to this. It's the answer to that. Uh, and you get a sense that there's all kinds of different questions being posed. But if we accept, if we start from the point of what I've just talked about, about the nature of the capitalist system and the nature of class society, if that's our starting point, then we need forms of organisations fit to the task. And if we learn from the experiences we've had using social media to build our campaigns, then there's no reason why the internet should not play an important and increasing role in left-wing political activity. In response to, to Malcolm Gladwell, you know, why the revolution won't be tweeted. Well, Twitter doesn't cause revolutions, but revolutions are tweeted, as we've seen in the example of, uh, of Egypt. And what we really need to do is move beyond this false polarization between the internet is the solution to all our problems or the internet is absolutely no use to try and anchor it in a class understanding of society, the need for revolutionary organization. And from that starting point, we can actually think much more productively about how we can use the internet to change the world. Thanks very much for some very interesting contributions. I think when Luigi says that um, when communications change and forms of communications change, then we change uh, some of the ways we organize. I think that really does hit the nail on the head because what I've been trying to put through in my talk is against those people who say that the internet means that we don't need organizations. The crucial thing then, though, is for those of us who do recognize that we absolutely do need political organizations, how can we use these different forms of technology? And the examples that Luigi uses are very, um, very interesting. Indeed, I agree with, um, with Mike uh, and Mark that we do need to up the way that we use uh, we use the internet. I think, for, I think that, you know, it's for example, that when uh, Mark says that he'll, he'll teach uh, uh, older comrades how to use Twitter and Facebook, I mean, I don't think he necessarily needs to teach older people how to use Facebook. One of the most adept users of Facebook uh, that I know um, is, is, is Alex Kalinikos in the SWP, who uses it incredibly well. I think it's not just the generational um, gap, although that is a, an aspect of it. But I, I just want to say about the way in which um, meetings are built, for example, through Facebook, where people are talking about, I gave the example of Hoover's. Let's also bear in mind, though, it's not just meetings that are organized on Facebook that fall flat, sometimes meetings that aren't. And also, what's been quite interesting, um, for example, in, 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 in recent months, um, the Defend the Right to Protest campaign, which was launched after some of the attacks um, uh, after the, the, um, the, the UK uncut occupation on the March the 26th um, and the, uh, the, the arrests on the Royal Wedding Day. This was a campaign that utilised existing relationships that we've built up through the student movement and other things, but very, very effectively used Facebook to pull together a meeting. Uh, and then to build uh, a campaign. So there are definitely real um, uses uh, that, are, that are there. Um, on, the, on the issue of WikiLeaks and the Palestine Papers, absolutely, I think that that, you, you know, the, the fact that the internet has changed the way in which uh, communication happens in some ways does mean that you can have these things spread much more quickly and that they can r reach out to wider layers of people. And, and on the issue of Al Jazeera, which I, which I didn't really uh, talk about, I think actually Al Jazeera played in some ways a much more important role in terms of spreading these kinds of things, particularly in the um, in the Arab world. And just to um, and just to just to finish, you know, there's questions of scale. You know, you want you when you have a telephone conversation with someone, that is something that you can do uh, depending on how many people you've got and how much time you've got. The good thing about Facebook or the internet, these kinds of things, is that the scale that you can use is much much broader. You don't have the same expectations of what you get out of it in that sense. But the comrade from Scotland, I thought made a very interesting uh, contribution, a very concrete contribution about how you can do these things, how you can bring them together. And, you know, finally, people say about the unions, you know, get on Facebook and Twitter and that'll get more young people to, to, to join the union. Absolutely get on Facebook, absolutely get on Twitter. If you want people to join Unison, ballot for strike action in the autumn. It's quite a simple, it's quite a simple um, thing that...
Uh, and so I think, I, I think just that, finally, I think they were very interesting contributions. And I think that, again, just to underline, when we get past that idea that the internet solves the problem of organisation, then we can start to grapple with the real questions about how can organisations use the internet. That's the crucial question for us.